page. I can see it. We're not singing during the Good morning and welcome to St. Andrew's Church. Um, I realise that most of you listening will realise that St. Andrew's has gone to uh, mostly um, online worship for the rest of January because of COVID restrictions. I'm here and James is here and a few choristers are gathered around and we're glad to have them um, but listening and being welcomed are very so via technology and we're glad that you're able to do that. Um, and as I have written to myself here, God isn't any less available because we happen to be physically distanced. Um, in today's service there will be a memorial moment in which I will remember by name those members of St. Andrews who died during 2021 and will light a candle in their memory. Not yet picked up. 2022 offering on groups and wish to do so, then please contact Rosemary in the church office and she will be, she's there, going to be there most mornings uh, during the week. Um, going forward, worship will be, is restricted here, but will be available via Facebook Live each Sunday at 11 and then it will be, the service will be placed on YouTube um, after the service. Uh, um, just, uh, Council Prayer, which we've been having at 10 o'clock each Thursday morning during the month of December, will continue, but we will do that online. So if anyone would like to join Chancel Prayer Thursdays at 10, we'll do that online. Just send me a, a notice or an email about that, and I will send you a link for that. I think those are our, our announcements for today. Um, we'll just take a moment of pause and then...
This call to worship I've chosen is, I think, so suitable for New Year. It comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 21. John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven, and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See things new. Let us worship God.
in him that you came to live in us, and through him we are bound to you in covenant, such that not even death itself can separate us from your love. By your Spirit, help us to bring all of ourselves to you in worship, this attention, our imagination, our desires, our heads, our hearts, our hands. And as we do that, we confess, gracious God, that some parts of ourselves are far from lovely or loving. Our words sometimes hurt rather than help others. Our actions or our love often contradicts our best efforts to be like Jesus. So, Lord, come, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, assuring, assuring us of God's pardon. The Apostle Paul wrote, If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. Amen. The old year has ended, the new one has begun. But before we travel too far into 2022, it's good to remember those dear to us who died during 2021. And what better place to acknowledge life's sorrows than here in church. The original member or friend come forward to light a candle in memory of those members of St Andrews who died during 2021. And the plan was to have then others in the congregation to come forward and light a candle in memory of their loved ones who died in 2021, but those who were not associated with St Andrews Church. The session's decision, decision to pause in-person worship prevents that plan from being carried out, but I will now name the four members of St Andrews Church who died last year and light a candle in their memory. But why do this? First, it's an opportunity for those who grieve and who still grieve to own their grief and express it within the life of the faith. Learning to live without someone we love beside us is a difficult transition not something that's resolved in a week or a month or even a year. Secondly, because those we've loved contributed so much meaning and significance to our lives, it's good that we not forget them, either in our own family life or in our church life. This memorial moment points us to God as the source of our hope and our comfort. Whatever you may have faced last year and what you may face this year, whether illness, bereavement or loneliness, God has promised to provide the light we need. And so we remember the members of our during 21. The first person I name is Johann Heim, who died last year on January 10th. The second man who died last year on January 14th. The third name I mentioned is Anne Marie Rigueur, who died on March the 8th last year.
The fourth name I mention is Lynn Bradley, who died on June the 25th last year. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we believe that the love of the Father that held you and that holds us through the valley of the shadow of death is real and dependable. May those who are part of this service this day in that belief we thank you, Lord, for all those who we remember this morning, those we named publicly just now, but others that each of us know who we loved, but who died. We praise you, Lord, for all that they meant to us and to you. Gracious, as the end of poverty and the beginning of riches, the end of frustration and the beginning of fulfillment. The end of fear and the beginning of peace. The end of pain and the beginning of joy. Lord Jesus, in light of your resurrection from the dead, we look to you to be our steadfast friend through this new year and indeed forever. Amen.
Today's scripture reading is taken from Isaiah 43, 14 to 21, and uh, further 25 to 44. Thus says the Lord your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I will send to Babylon and break down all the bars and shouting of the Chaldeans. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus says the Lord who makes the way of the sea, a path in mighty waters, who brings a chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise, they are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things, or consider the things of old. I am about to do new things, a new thing. Now it springs forth. I will make a way in the wilderness, the rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to drink, to give drink to the chosen, my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, so that they might declare my praise. I, I am he who blots out the transgressions for your sake, and I will not remember your sins. Accuse me, let us go to trial, might you may be proved right. Your first ancestor sinned, and your interpreters transgressed against me. Therefore, I profane the princes of, of the sanctuary. I delivered Jacob to utter destruction and Israel to revival. But now hear, O Jacob, my servant, Israel whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you in the womb and will help you. Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant, for I will pour water on the thirsty land and street, streams onto the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your descendants and my blessings on your offspring. They shall spring up like green tamarisk, like willows, by flowing streams. And the next reading is from Hebrews 10, 19 to 25. That's Hebrews 10. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and the living way that he hath opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have great priests over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from the evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, of, the, of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
the transition from one year to the next can sometimes be difficult, especially if we are grieving the death of some of you listening to me and you're not quite ready to move on. And you feel very little joy in the present or have diminished expectations for the future. And yet, if we're not to drown in pain, we must move on. But how? How? When life disappoints us, follows, does not go away easily. And such was the situation among the Jews to whom the prophet Isaiah addressed the words we just read from Isaiah 43 and part of 44. Judah, Judah had been led waste in 587 BC by the Babylonian army. The icon of Jewish faith lay in ruins. Some 80 to 100,000 Jews were transported in chains as prisoners into exile in Babylon. And there those exiles, utterly dejected, talked of what, how life used to be in the days of Abraham, and Moses, and David, and as they made to Jerusalem's festivals. God had seemed so alive then. But in their present moment, those joys were distant memories. Now they were stuck, stuck in Babylon without hope and seemingly without a future. Worse, their despair led them to conclude that though John, God had once been out, he was either unable or unwilling to act with power for them now. It's into that pain that Isaiah the prophet spoke these interrupting words to interrupt their nostalgia, to bring them this word from God. And the key text and focus on is verse 43, where God gives Isaiah this message to pass on to those exiles, and his word was this, do not remember the former things, or consider the things of old. I'm about to do a new thing. Now it is about to spring forth. We want to think this morning about what new thing God is promising those exiles. But before we turn to that, let's not read verse 18 as a call to forget the past. It says, do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. And people are not unsurprisingly think, oh, well, I'm supposed to forget things. But the thing is, endlessly, the Bible tells us to remember, to remember. Remember your leaders. Remember the saints of the past. Remember Jesus. Not least when you celebrate the Lord's Supper. You know well that as humans we cannot fully function unless we have our memory. As those of you who have dementia or who care for those with dementia know only too well. Memory is one of God's most precious gifts who are remembering loved ones who died last year. You want to remember them. You hold on to your memory, even though it sometimes hurts to do so. And so almost certainly what Isaiah 43 verse 18 means, not it means not forget things, but rather do not remember the former things or consider the things of old as if you were to live in the past. Oblivious to the new things that God has planned for you. But as 2022 gets underway, it's hard for some of us to imagine what new thing God might want to do in our lives some of you may well feel, the best part of my life is over. It's unlikely that the future is going to bring me much joy. Even worse, you may feel, as did the Jewish exiles in Babylon a long time ago, you may feel 
that actually God has given up on you. Let's think about that, not just as it applies to us personally, but as it applies to us as a congregation. That their best days are behind them. They're over. Lie in line the past. And that whatever he's up to, God isn't about to do a new thing among them. I'm not among those people that think like that. Such limited, cynical, self-defeating, God-denying language and thoughts say far more about fraud, finite, faithless church, utterly faithful God, who scripture tells us can give to the driest of bones new life, and can give to the most woebegone congregation a new start. If God is alive, if Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then he's able, despite our flaws and failures, our sorrows of the past, we could never imagine. Nothing is impossible for God. Probably those words would end the sermon. That's probably a good point to end, by the way. Nothing is impossible for God. That's what Isaiah was really saying to the exiles stuck in Babylon. But it's the message really of the whole Bible. And you'll notice perhaps that I began this sermon and a new earth, a new heaven and a new earth. So let's never poo-poo the new thing that God is able to do and wants to do in our lives or in the life of our congregation either. To suggest the newness that God is able and that God wants to bring to us, the prophet Isaiah uses a host of to highlight God's future plans. At Isaiah 43, 14, God says to the exiled Jews, I will send to Babylon and break down all the bars. At verse 19, I will make a way in the wilderness. At verse 25, I am he who blots out your transgressions. I will not remember your sins. And then to chapter 44, verse 3, I will pour water. Talk about God being active in the future. There's promise after promise after promise of this new thing that God's going to do. Let me mention some of these promises. I'll just pay attention to them. The first one comes at verse 19 of chapter 43. Promise number one. I will make a way in the wilderness. Isaiah 43 refers here provided a way through the wilderness for the Hebrews escaping slavery in Egypt. That was the great sort of model of redemption and freedom and release all through the Bible. Now, if you don't remember the details of that escape, how God made a way through the wilderness for those slaves, ex-slaves, you'll find them in the book of Exodus. And if you don't want to read the book of Exodus, then watch Charles S. B. Moses. No doubt, of course, some cynical Jews stuck in Babylon protested that, that what God had done was long, long, long centuries before. To which, of course, Isaiah the prophet responds, God is about to do that again. God, God is able, God specializes in providing a way to provide a way out when we're stuck. The book of Hebrews, part of which we read from chapter 10, goes so far as to say that God has opened up for us a way out of the grave, into the fullness of life through Jesus Christ. He's opened a way for us. If you're stuck, or if there's no pleasure in the present, or if you're faithful, fearful of the future, hold on to this promise. God says, I will make a way for you through the wilderness. But if God promised the exiles a way out, he also promised them a new pardon. In 43, 25, I am he who blots out your transgressions. 
and I will not remember your sins. What a wonderful verse that is. I have a new way for you, he says. And I've got a new pardon. The exiles were stuck, and they were stuck with a problem, and their problem was this. Even if they believed the first thing, no doubt they thought to themselves, how are we supposed to take the, at that offer? Because they knew, and they knew that God knew, that they had had a long history of either ignoring God or being totally hostile to God. And they knew, and they knew that God knew, that while living in pagan in Babylon, Many of them have compromised their faith and their morals. And they wondered to themselves, how can we accept God's promise of a way home? We're guilty. We're guilty. People in 21st century Canada don't really believe in guilt anymore. It's one of those words that it belongs in the vocabulary of old time presbyterian guilt. But think about it. Our generation has squandered the earth's resources in greatly unprecedented rates. To this day, one billion people in this world suffer from obesity while another billion regularly goes hungry. Pride, hatred, prejudice, and a sort of self-centeredness that uses people and then tosses them aside. Well, it's all as rampant as ever. Not just in society at large, but even within congregations. We push God to the side because, well, quite frankly, we don't want to be answerable to anybody but ourselves. And in face of all failures of those exiles and of our own right now, God offers this wide open promise of a new pardon. No matter who we are, where we've been, or what we've done. I will make a way in the wilderness. And when you go, I will blot out your transgressions. I will not remember your sins. I to make you clean. I want to cancel your sin. I want you to set you free. All of that is a new thing God promises every one of us. I want to quote some words from my late friend, Leonard Griffith, who tells us how this happens. How does God free us? How does he pardon us? And Leonard Griffith writes that our God is a pardoning God not just because of what he has said, but because of something that he's done. We believe that there's a place of pardon, a place where we can come with the heaviest burden of guilt, a place where we stand condemned before God, and yet where God will lift that burden of guilt and block out our transgressions. This is a lonely hill where a man hangs dying on a cross. Now to promise number three. If God offers a new way and a new part, God also offers, in this text from Isaiah 43, God offers a new life. And at Isaiah 44, verse 3, God pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your descendants and blessing on your offspring. Preachers like it when texts say exactly what they wanted to say. My third promise is a promise of new life. Well, the text doesn't say new life. Instead, the text pictures it. Pictures it as water for the thirsty. Some of you have no doubt been to Israel. I've been to Israel, and I'll never forget getting up one morning leaving the hotel in Tel Aviv and driving through on a highway. One side of the highway was dead, desert, nothing. The other side was the most glorious rows after rows after rows of dark, olive green leaved orange groves. No water on the other side, irrigated. 
water, water. In a desert country like Israel, where our prophet lived, nothing could live. You died without water, but with it you lived. And so water became either no water, death, with water, life. Clear of water, it's God promising us new life for dried up people. That promise of new life, of course, God's promise here of new life, is hugely amplified and clarified in the New Testament by de Jesus' death shattering resurrection. The New Testament pulsates throughout with this sense of newness. Which says Revelation 21, which, with which I began the service, will one day be so total that God will, God will wipe every tear from our eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. And all things will be made new. Sometimes we get so tired of the same old, same old. And that is precisely what God offered these new exiles in Babylon. A new way out, a new pardon, a new life. And of course that promise of God still stands. An older married couple was once driving down a highway for a Sunday afternoon drive. A pickup truck in front of them. And in the truck in front of them, the older couple could see a young couple. Obviously very much in love because the girl in the truck was sitting as close as possible to the young driver, her boyfriend. Watching him from the car behind, the older wife said to her long-time husband, We used to sit that close. What happened? What happened? The husband replied, <laughs> Over the centuries, over the century, God hasn't moved one iota from any of his promises, nor rescinded any of his promises. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. Don't live in the past, God says. I'm about to do a new thing. God springs forth a new path, a new way, a new pardon, a new life. We're not being told here to forget the past nor to deny the pain of loss. What the text tells us is this. Don't get stuck in the past. Don't give up on the newness, the new things that God wants to do. Invite God, as this year begins, invite God to do the new things God can do and wants to do in your life. And I will do the same. Amen. Our offering will be received. <clears throat>
is that we'll find joy when we offer the needs of others. Take the gifts we bring this day so that our lives and the lives of others will be blessed and your name be truly honored. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. scattered across the globe. For children who are handicapped in any way, we ask your protection. For those who are in trouble because of their own behavior, we ask your mercy and restoration. For those who are having housing, we ask your compassion. For your church, Lord, in every part of the world, we ask for your wisdom. For all who labor for peace in this world and the freedom of those who are stuck, we ask your guidance and strength. Those who gather to pray in the name of Jesus, receive our prayers for all in need and grant your salvation to them and to us through our Savior Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray to say, Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Lopez. <laughs>